For tonight's community conversation, Congresswoman Presley will give an update on current work in Congress. And then at the end, we will have an opportunity to answer your questions. We wanna say thank you again to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. We will try to get through as many as we can in addition to uh, questions that are submitted in the chat. Unfortunately, we may not be able to get through every uh, single question, but our staff will do our best to reach out and answer every single question uh, we do not get to, to end up answering tonight for this town hall. If you would like to contact our office, please visit our website, presley.house.gov, or call our district office directly at 617-850-0040. Again, that is presley.house.gov or 617-850-0040. Now it is my pleasure to hand it over to Congresswoman Presley. Wonderful, thank you, Art, for that introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for making it a priority. Uh, you lead very demanding lives. You could be anywhere else. Uh, but here, but the fact that you uh, decided to spend your evening with us uh, means so much. Thank you for participating in our monthly town hall series. It's always good to be in virtual community with you. And first and foremost, I do want to say I hope that um, you and your family are safe and healthy and remain as such. These monthly conversations are an opportunity for me to keep you updated on our work in Congress and to hear directly from you about the pressing issues that are top of mind for you. Now, while many may want to be finished with this pandemic, this pandemic is certainly not yet finished with us. I know the impact that it has had on our quality of life, our public health, our, our mental health, but we are still in this pandemic. And I know that so many workers and families are continuing to struggle with the ongoing economic and public health impacts of this pandemic. In every room that I'm in, every virtual table that I sit at, I continue to hear from folks struggling to cover the skyrocketing costs of housing and childcare. I hear from educators and young people about the challenges of the mental health crisis impacting our communities. It remains my mission to ensure that our hardest hit communities get the resources necessary to get back on track and lay the groundwork for a just and equitable long-term recovery, which leaves no worker, no family, and no community behind. Just last week, Congress passed and President Biden signed into law a monumental budget bill, which includes over 53 billion, that's with a B, $53 billion to help address the housing crisis, over $6 billion to help alleviate the skyrocketing costs of childcare, and $2 billion to combat the mental health crisis, including dedicated resources for mental health supports for children and youth. I'm also incredibly proud to report that after nearly a year's worth of advocacy and organizing, this funding bill includes more than $8 million in direct funding for community projects across each one of the seven cities and towns in the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District. These are gains and investments unprecedented that my team worked very hard throughout the course of a year in collaboration with community uh, to see realized. These investments of these community uh, projects again, totaling $8 million. They range from mitigating the impact of climate change to investing in workforce development, to addressing the opioid crisis, to expanding access to quality education and more. These projects represent a massive investment in what is our most valuable infrastructure, our most worthwhile investment, our people. Our most vulnerable communities have been my closest partners throughout this process, and I'm glad to report that I've been able to deliver this $8 million in federal funding so that these projects can move forward. This will be the first time in over a decade that Congress includes direct funding for community-based projects like these. And I'm looking forward to getting these critical resources to the 7th District. On the topic of Ukraine, this bill also includes over $4 billion in humanitarian aid and refugee assistance for the people of Ukraine who have been the target of Putin's unconscionable and illegal invasion. I wanna extend my solidarity and support for the people of Ukraine from Kiev all the way to the Massachusetts 7th. 
you know, loved ones all around the world who have watched in horror as innocent civilians have borne the brunt of Putin's war of aggression. Now, over the past several weeks, I also voted to ban Russian energy imports and to suspend special trade relations with Russia and Belarus. These efforts will help undermine Putin's war effort and hold him and his regime accountable for the blatant and ongoing human rights abuses. This is a humanitarian crisis. The United States must respond with compassion. Within days of the invasion, I join my colleagues in calling for the Biden administration to designate Ukraine for temporary protected status. I was grateful to see the administration heed our calls and even announce a moratorium of deportations to Ukraine. This decision will save lives and is the exact type of administrative discretion that we have been asking to be extended to asylum seekers fleeing Haiti and other black migrants fleeing humanitarian crises around the world. I'm very proud to be the co-chair of the House Haiti Caucus and to represent the third largest concentration of the Haitian diaspora in the country. This is why I've remained steadfast in my calls for the administration to end the use of Title 41 and to finally halt deportations to Haiti. For two years now, the xenophobic and Trump era policy has remained on the books and has led to the deportations of thousands of migrant families. It is simply unconscionable. I refuse to give up on this fight and will continue to work and organize until all asylum seekers are treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Earlier today, I had the humbling honor uh, to be uh, in the room for the uh, Senate confirmation hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson as the first black woman ever to serve on the United States Supreme Court. When the news broke about Justice Breyer's retirement, I joined my fellow Congresswomen of the Congressional Black Caucus, 15 of us, in calling on President Biden to uphold his promise of nominating a Black woman to the Supreme Court and ensuring that she have a background in upholding civil rights and equal justice under the law. I'm so proud that President Biden kept his word, met the moment, and nominated a supremely qualified nominee and I'm looking forward to seeing Judge Jackson confirmed in the coming weeks. It has been powerful to bear witness to her testimony. She's highly qualified and she will uphold the law in a principled way. I'm also proud of her time spent in the Massachusetts 7th as a student at Harvard. And with that, I will now uh, turn us back to Art Gordon, senior advisor in my district office, which is based in Hyde Park. Uh, the neighborhood that I'm also proud to call my home community, uh, where my husband uh, Conan and our daughter Cora live. And Art will um, kick us off on some pre-submitted questions, which I thank you for uh, submitting. And we'll also be taking some questions in real time as well. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Presley, for those updates. Uh, now it's time to get into uh, our question and answer period. And we have some pre-submitted questions. so. Uh, we want to make sure we answer those. So, uh, Congresswoman Presley, our first submitted question, pre-submitted question, uh, Brian from Boston asked, many of us are worried about our Ukrainian neighbors and their families back home who are under assault and enduring severe hardship due to Putin's invasion. What have you done to support the Ukrainian people and to hold Putin accountable? Brian, thank you so much for that question. And I know I got into some of this in my remarks, but um, I'll revisit uh, some of that and also expound. Uh, there is no doubt that Putin's war is illegal and unjust. His invasion is an attack on both democracy and international law. And so in, in every decision, I'm centering the Ukrainian people on the ground and standing in solidarity as well with the Russian people who are protesting this invasion. I was proud to vote in support of billions of dollars in humanitarian aid to support the Ukrainian people and millions of refugees who need urgent relief. My colleagues and I acted swiftly, again, to urge the Biden administration to designate Ukraine for temporary protected status, TPS, and to immediately halt deportations. This is a common sense and humane policy that we must now replicate for Cameroon and other non-European countries. Our outrage must be equitable. 
Um, but again, uh, so far as this ongoing crisis, we have to hold Putin accountable. And I've supported targeted sanctions against him and his oligarchs. And I also voted to ban Russian oil and gas imports that are fueling Putin's war machine and to suspend permanent normal trade relations with Russia. I serve on the House Financial Services Committee, and so we spent a fair amount of time there uh, talking about uh, sanctions and um, also other ways with which to uh, threaten and to undermine the oligarchs and to make sure that assets and wealth um, is not being hidden. I remain opposed to broad-based sanctions that will hurt innocent Russian people, like the thousands who have taken to the streets to protest Putin's war. We must respond with compassion to both the Ukrainian people here in the seven who are experiencing immense trauma and pain. And let me also reiterate, because our destinies are tied, that we have to extend uh, that same uh, compassion to the Russian neighbors in the Massachusetts seven and small business owners who are experiencing xenophobia, xenophobia and hate simply because they are Russian. So I continue to have faith that diplomacy will prevail, will prevail. I will keep urging President Biden to remain at the table and to negotiate an end to this conflict. This is about saving lives. We have to leave no stone unturned to avoid further escalation. If anyone here is directly impacted by the conflict or knows someone who is, my office stands ready to assist with any casework needs. Uh, and again, you can contact my district office at 617-850-0040. And a member of my staff will get back to you. Again, that's 617-850-0040. Thank you, Congresswoman. Next question. Stephanie from Jamaica Plain asks, are there any COVID funds still available to help cover rent, internet, and how does one go about getting help with a laptop? Okay. Um, Stephanie, before I get to your question, I did just wanna uh, clarify, um, you know, certainly I've been working very hard to see this um, weaponized um, law uh, uh, repealed um, and I, uh, regarding the unjust deportations of Haitians. And um, it appears that I said Title 41, uh, that was a, a mistake. Um, so just uh, consider that a, an, an error of uh, atrophy, <laughs> but it is Title 42. And I just wanted to make sure uh, to correct that for the record. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for your question. I cannot stress just enough how frequently I hear from constituents uh, on issues like this that they're facing as they struggle to keep themselves and their families safely housed. It's an issue that comes up in almost every community gathering I'm in, and housing issues continue to be one of our most common requests for casework assistance here in my district office. And this remains one of my top priorities in my role on the Financial Services Committee. And we fought hard for the inclusion of COVID-related emergency rental assistance. Just last week, my team and I convened a roundtable to discuss progress in getting these resources out the doors and the way in which we need to keep the fight up. Thankfully, Stephanie, there are still emergency rental assistance resources available. Since you're in Boston, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to the city's Office of Housing Stability. They have truly been a model for the nation uh, in, um, in meeting the urgent needs of our residents. They can help you apply for emergency resources to cover rent and utilities. Now, it's important to remember that if you can't pay rent due to COVID-related financial hardship and have a pending rental assistance application, you, Stephanie, you and anyone you may know in this precarious situation, you cannot be evicted. I want to underscore that. If you cannot pay rent, due to COVID-related financial arch hardship, and you have a pending rental assistance application, you cannot be evicted. So please do follow up with the city's office um, of housing stability at Boston uh, City Hall. It's important uh, also to remember that there's a critical program that is available for you um, regarding your internet needs, and that is the Affordable Connectivity Program which was extended as a part of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. 
Now this program helps to provide eligible households with up to $30 per month to help cover broadband services and up to $100 in a one-time discount towards a tablet or computer. Now, Stephanie, if you'd like to learn more and find out if you are eligible, you can head to acpbenefit.org. Again, that's acpbenefit.org. And again, I'll give another plug uh, for my hardworking and dedicated uh, A-team, that's what I call them, uh, in our district office uh, located in Hyde Park. If you need any help on this front, you can reach them directly at 617-850-0040. And we stand ready to support and to connect you uh, to those resources. Our next question comes from Adam from Cambridge, who wrote a question on student debt cancellation. So Adam writes, uh, student loan forgiveness was discussed a lot before President Biden took office, and most of the progressive lawmakers made promises as well. What kind of future do young Americans like myself, who can't afford rent in my hometown of Cambridge and can't even afford to pay back my student loans, have to look forward to? Will student loan debt be forgiven? Well, Adam, thank you so much for this question. And please know that uh, I certainly uh, have not given up this fight. And I've been leading this fight uh, in the House to cancel student debt and to address this nearly $2 trillion student debt crisis as the economic and racial justice issue uh, that it is. Um, we have been successful uh, in that this movement continues to grow and, in fact, uh, twice during this pandemic. Uh, we've been able to get the administration to pause student loan payments, uh, looking for them to exact every lever possible to alleviate this hardship. And we know that because of those savings, people have been able to remain safely housed, to put food on the table. Some people have even become a first uh, generation home buyers. And so that is just one example of how transformational and impactful this will be. Uh, this crisis is affecting people from every walk of life. Uh, seniors living on fixed incomes, still paying student debt. I have some as old as 76 years old. Uh, parents, uh, you know, my age, I'm 48, who are still paying on their loans and now uh, paying on their children's loans. And then, of course, um, your peers, uh, many of whom uh, can't, you know, purchase a home. Uh, pay their rent, uh, would love to start a business and can't do that. So this debt is choking at the promise of our commonwealth and our country. And I continue to uh, advocate for President Biden to use the same authority that he did to pause student loan payments, uh, to cancel student debt at $50,000 broad-based. Uh, that will help 80% of those in the lowest income bracket. Uh, again, this is an economic justice issue. It is a racial justice issue. In less than 50 days, uh, those student loan payments are scheduled to restart. And again, with that same exact authority President Biden has used to pause student loan payments granted to him by Congress through the Higher Education Act, he can and should cancel student debt by executive acts. That's just a stroke of a pen. Uh, and then hopefully this will encourage you, since you were specifically naming progressive lawmakers, the Congressional Progressive Caucus unveiled a series of executive actions that the entire caucus is throwing our full weight behind and student debt cancellation was included on that list. Um, I believe that when we organize, we win. And it is because people like you have been willing to share your story um, that we are closer now than ever before. A student debt used to be treated uh, cancellation as sort of a marginal issue. And this is now a part of the national uh, conversation and a priority for many, uh, myself chief amongst them. So I'm proud to be leading this fight for broad-based student debt cancellation. In less than 50 days, those payments that we have paused twice during the pandemic will restart. And rather than even doing another pause, I urge the administration to use the authority granted to them by Congress and to cancel student debt. And of course, um, uh, there's more work to be done when it comes to the affordability of college uh, which is why I believe we need tuition free uh, community college. Uh, we need more Pell Grants, um, but uh, this is a one, one strategy that would be immediately impactful. Um, and then we can uh, continue the other work and be of dual tracks 
uh, to ultimately make college uh, much more affordable. We have a follow-up question with this one. Uh, Memory from Boston asks, how are you advocating for student loan debt forgiveness in particular? Also, how can we make sure that graduate student loans are also included? Thank you, Memory. Uh, that's an important question. So we're gonna have to continue to organize and to build consensus on this. Um, last year, uh, my partners in this uh, advocacy, Leader Schumer and Senator Warren, we introduced legislation which outlined the executive pathway that President Biden could take to get student debt cancellation done um, again by executive order. And the, re the resolution focused on how we can provide cancellation for the millions with federal student loans, graduate students included. Now, as I said, uh, momentum and this movement continues to grow. And so over time, our resolution has garnered more than 80 co-sponsors in the House and Senate. And we've seen a vast array of economic and racial justice experts come out in support of debt cancellation as a way to spur economic recovery, to create jobs, uh, to help reduce the racial wealth gap. We have sent multiple letters to the administration to show the growing coalition in support of this much needed policy action. This is how we are uh, using every tool at our disposal to push towards substantive and impactful policy and relief for our communities. I mean, we don't wanna leave anyone uh, behind because we know that this is a very heavy burden. And in fact, um, right before our town hall this evening, I was on an organizing call with uh, grassroots uh, activists and some of my progressive colleagues from throughout the country to kick off an effort in support of a broad swath of executive actions um, as I said, that were uh, rolled out as a part of the Congressional Progressive Caucus that we are urging President Biden to take. So we just have to, to keep the, the momentum up. You know, uh, uh, Congress responds uh, and, and, and they respond and they have been uh, to the strength of this movement. And so uh, we just have to remain vigilant. Our next question, uh, Karina in Somerville is organizing uh, congressional support on a particular bill. Uh, so Karina asks if you will co-sponsor uh, Rep. Bobby Rush's Martha Wright Prison Phone Justice Act, which is H.R. 2489. Uh, it will require the FCC to regulate in-state calls and set an interim rate cap of five, four or five cents which is desperately needed, particularly for those serving sentences in county jails. This bill is parallel to the initiatives to make calls free to families and those incarcerated, such as the legislation that is passed in Connecticut. Okay, Karina in Somerville, I wanna say this is an example, you know, because I really always wanna govern in partnership uh, with community. And I hope you know just how a powerful each and every one of you are. Now, this is an issue that I'm familiar with, um, but I was not immediately familiar with the bill, although this is an issue that I've worked on uh, in my time on the Boston City Council and now in Congress. And uh, I just wanna say how much I appreciate it when you make us aware of these bills, because there are, at any given time, there can be 12,000 pieces of active legislation during a legislative session. And so I appreciate your flagging important bills like this and getting them on our radar. Um, look, this is an injustice. The, the, the charging of exorbitant fees uh, for phone calls is really an example of what I call a uh, policy violence. And since my time on the city council, I've repeatedly called for this to end last year. I supported the change by county sheriffs to provide 10 minute calls for free in jails, but we have to go even further. Uh, here in the Commonwealth and throughout the country. And again, the fact that we had that victory and that the sheriffs responded is a testament to the power of organizing and community members and loved ones raising their voices. Um, I also, uh, several years ago, introduced the People's Justice Guarantee, which is a, a, a radical reimagining of our criminal legal system. And I did that in partnership with many people in community, uh, impacted families, uh, folks behind the wall, and in my People's Justice Guarantee, I specifically call for free phone calls and video teleconferencing. 
Maintaining strong community and familial bonds and ending prison debt are critical to reducing recidivism and enabling successful reentry. Um, I have uh, had many loved ones um, who are incarcerated, and I know, um, you know, and unfortunately that they were incarcerated because uh, they suffer from substance use disorder, and uh, this uh, disease was criminalized, and so uh, they were incarcerated. You know, I, I think what they deserved was was on-demand uh, treatment. Um, and actually, one of our community-based uh, projects within that $8 million is $1 million uh, alone just to address uh, the opioid uh, crisis. Um, but um, you know, these phone calls are a lifeline. And maintaining those bonds are also critical to, again, reducing recidivism and ensuring successful reintegration uh, into society. So, I'm gonna to continue to fight for our, our neighbors and our loved ones behind the wall. Uh, again, they are moms and dads who need to hear from their kids. They are loved ones uh, that are motivated by calls from home. And I will uh, absolutely uh, bring this bill to the attention of, of my legislative director. And you can expect a call from my team soon. So thank you for flagging this bill. And I would encourage others to do the same. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I do, I know, Want to remind just some of the folks who are tuning in with us that that's the Martha Wright Prison uh, Phone Justice Act, and that is HR twenty four eighty nine. Again, that's HR twenty four eighty nine for anyone who wants to look up that bill. Uh, moving along to our next question, Griselda from Chelsea asks, "I am concerned about new reports on a new variant. What are you doing to make sure that we are prepared for next wave?" How can we do our part to keep our families and communities safe? Yeah, Griselda, I mean, your, your question is really, um, you know, it's timely and it's, it's uh, sobering because it speaks to our new realities. You know, uh, my team and I continue to track the case numbers closely. We're keeping um, a close eye on the new Omicron subvariant. The trends in Europe and Japan are certainly troubling, and experts have said that this subvariant now accounts for more than half of the new cases in the New England area. So this is why I continue calling for a COVID relief package so that we are providing more federal resources, resources that can meet people in community where they are for PPE, for vaccines. Again, I, I know we're all fatigued and tired of the pandemic, but the pandemic is not completely over and we need to make sure that we're continuing to center the public health and invest in the critical health infrastructure necessary to make sure that we are ready. Um, and, and that includes um, ensuring that all of our you know, relative agencies and departments can, can respond, that we can get um, aid to families quickly, that, that we uh, have the workforce necessary. I've also been leading the charge for investments in research and treatment for long COVID. Millions have been left to suffer on their own without access to care for far too long. I urge the CDC early in the pandemic uh, to begin collecting data on the prevalence of long COVID so we can understand the trends and make sure we are increasing access to care and support. This is really a crisis which requires our immediate attention. And I've been spending um, I have personally and my team a fair amount of time uh, with those who've been impacted by long COVID uh, to better understand their challenges and the healthcare access issues that they have been facing. Uh, that being said, I can't stress enough the importance of getting vaccinated uh, and boosted, and we all need to do our part to limit community spread. So I will do a plug uh, to find a COVID vaccine near you. You can visit www.vaccines.gov. Again, that's www.vaccines.gov. Uh, there are also still free at home COVID tests available. So if you've not already requested some uh, to request your order of four free test kits by mail, please visit www.covidtest.gov. And for those who are not able to access the internet, or would like to request their test by phone, you can call 1-800-232-0233. Again, that's 1-800-232-0233.
or by teletype writer 1-888-720-7489. And that phone line is open from 8 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week, and offers assistance in more than 150 languages. Congresswoman, our next question is from Ann, who is from Cambridge. And Ann asks, we need legislation which repairs and restores a robust and sustainable public health system and infrastructure. What are your views on improving public health at the federal and local levels? Well, you know, Ann, I appreciate the question. And, it, and in fact, um, it gets to the core of what was my very motivation uh, for uh, running for Congress. The Massachusetts 7th is the most unequal district in our delegation and one of the most unequal in the country. Uh, there are disparate outcomes, uh, including and especially when it comes to public health outcomes. In fact, in a three mile radius from Harvard Square, from Cambridge to Nubian Square to Roxbury, life expectancy drops um, by 30 years. And in the past two years, we have witnessed public health crisis like spikes in opioid overdoses, unprecedented trauma. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, there's really no way to fix our public health system, um, which is why I have to take a comprehensive approach that gets to the root of, of several problems. Uh, and so uh, one I'll lift up is um, legislation that I introduced in partnership with Senator Warren and Representative Barbara Lee. And this is federal legislation to create a national center on anti-racism at the CDC to finally declare racism as the public health crisis that it is. And I was very uh, pleased to see several municipalities in the Massachusetts 7 uh, pass resolutions on their city councils uh, affirming that racism is a public health crisis. And the legislation that we introduced is called the Anti-Racism and Public Health Act which would provide research and investments into eliminating structural racism. And you mentioned uh, local uh, public health. It would award grants to local public health departments to adopt evidence-based practices. Um, another thing uh, in this uh, area is that I continue to fight for our community centers, our community health centers. Um, in fact, uh, the Massachusetts 7 has the most community health centers of any district in the country. We have 15 one in three of my constituents receive their care from a community health center. And uh, they have been so critical to combating health disparities, of course, to, uh, to, to, to staving off uh, the spread of the pandemic. Uh, they provide uh, culturally congruent care. And I was very um, proud to have delivered you know, tens of millions of dollars to the community health centers in the Massachusetts 7. And, and then uh, just two more points on this. Um, and as a member of the Committee on Oversight and Reform, uh, we are examining the failures in health equity due to the greed of those who uh, prioritize profits over people. Uh, and so we're examining the failures in health equity due to the greed of health insurance companies. And I'm gonna continue to fight, of course, for universal coverage and Medicare for all legislation uh, because healthcare uh, is a human right. Congresswoman, our next question is from Crystal and Everett. And Crystal asks and says, I am particularly concerned about the youth mental health crisis going on in this country. So what are you doing to address this issue? Crystal, thank you so much for this question. This was an issue that I led on um, on the Boston City Council, actually creating the first policy committee to name the issue of trauma. Uh, it's an issue um, that I've continued to lead on uh, while in Congress convening the first ever um, congressional hearing in the Oversight Committee on Childhood Trauma. And it is my fear that if we don't do what we need to in this moment, that childhood trauma will actually be the second uh, pandemic. So this youth mental health crisis demands immediate action. There was so much that our young people were already uh, burdened by. They were already in mental health crisis because of uh, the various um, ways in which their houses, their homes rather, have been destabilized. 
um, and the trauma that so many of them already experience. And so that's been worsened by this pandemic. And it's uh, also why I introduced the End Push Out Act, um, the Counseling Not Criminalization Act, and also the Strong Support for Children Act and the Children's Protection Act. Um, I am seeking to legislate uh, healing in the same way that I believe for many decades we have uh, legislated many generations uh, hurt and harm. And so for me, where that begins is uh, in our learning communities, ensuring that our young people have equitable access to a school nurse, to a social worker, um, those social emotional, um, to, a, to a psychologist, those social emotional supports are critical to uh, their health and well being and also to uh, their readiness to learn. I'm also a proud member of the Congressional Black Caucus's Task Force on Black Youth Suicide and Mental Health. Um, again, uh, during the pandemic, we've seen an increase in our young people with anxiety, depression, suicide ideation, and um, that has been especially true for our most vulnerable youth, uh, youth of color, um, LGBTQ youth. And so I continue to lean in on, um, on that crisis. I have just frequently sounded this alarm. I'll continue to. And, and then I'll just close um, by saying that after my uh, hearing on childhood trauma in the Oversight Committee, I introduced two bills with the chair of the Oversight Committee, Carolyn Maloney from New York. Again, that's the Strong Support for Children Act and the Children's Protection Act to ensure that we are adequately assessing uh, policies and crises that affect our children. Um, uh, that we're assessing those. And I continue to advocate for the White House to have a trauma-informed recovery from this pandemic, from this public health crisis, this pandemic-induced recession. Um, and, and I will keep, um, keep banging the drum on that. Again, it's, it's my fear um, that the second pandemic will be childhood trauma. We have hundreds of thousands of young people who have lost a parent um, a grandparent, a caregiver. Um, it is just um, the psychological toll and impact of all of this uh, must be uh, confronted. And we have to do everything possible to have those interventions to get our young people uh, on a pathway uh, to wellness. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for that answer. Uh, Harvey from Brighton asked, do you support legislation to eliminate the Social Security windfall elimination provision. This provision hurts individuals who worked in the public sector. When they apply for Social Security benefits, their benefits are reduced because they are also receiving a government pension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Harvey, thank you so much. This is uh, an issue I'm, I'm very familiar with. It's an issue I heard about uh, early on in my time in Congress, uh, beginning three years ago. And originally the windfall provision, it was intended to actually equalize the social security benefit formula, but in reality, it has unfairly penalized millions of public employees. And this is why I supported uh, Chairman Richie Neal's Public Servants Protection and Fairness Act, which would modernize this formula and provide immediate relief through a $150 monthly rebate for current retirees impacted by the windfall and also set a fair formula for future retirees. Now this bill um, has 187 co-sponsors and I'm hoping that it makes uh, much needed progress soon. Thank you for your question. Our next question uh, comes from Sarah from Boston. She says, I saw that you were Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearing today. Uh, so what was it like? And do you have any reactions from that historic event? She is uh, supremely qualified. Um, she's overqualified. And, and we are long overdue uh, for the, the, uh, the confirmation, uh, the appointment of a Black woman to the Supreme Court. And uh, it was a very heady experience. I'm, I'm humbled that I could be there and bear witness to history. Um, her integrity is uh, unparalleled. Her record speaks for itself. Her command of the law, 
for equal application of the law. Um, she will bring balance, fairness, and integrity to the courts, and also powerful representation in being the first Black woman uh, to serve uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, and so um, it, it, was, uh, it was a great day. And, and, and I'll also just say, um, speaking to the power of representation, um, the fact that, um, that Judge Jackson uh, wears her hair in a, uh, a popular protective hairstyle uh, in the African-American community uh, called Sister Locks. And last week, Massachusetts passed, was the 15th state in the country uh, to pass the Crown Act uh, banning uh, race-based hair discrimination, uh, which Black women have disproportionately experienced um, simply for how our hair grows out of our, our head. Um, or because we are expressing uh, ethno, uh, afno, Afrocentric pride, uh, wearing our hair in a style uh, identical to the one that uh, Judge Jackson is wearing. And uh, of course, last week on the federal level, the House passed the Crown Act, uh, which is a bill that I'm an original co-sponsor for. And so um, there were just the, the power of just all that representation, um, how she shows up in the world, how she shows up in the room, uh, how she comported herself, her poise, um, her grace, her intellect. Uh, it was just an honor to be there and, and truly a very heady experience. And I'm um, looking forward to her confirmation. Uh, Congresswoman, our next question is from Edward from High Park. And Edward asks, is there any progress report on your efforts to support free transit efforts? Oh, this is a very uh, timely, timely question. Um, just yesterday, I think that was yesterday. I don't know. It's all a blur. Um, you know, uh, I was uh, riding uh, the 23 bus in Boston uh, with uh, Mayor Wu and former Mayor Kim Janey. Uh, the three of us are public transit riders and have always been a champions uh, for government to invest in public transit as the public good that it is. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, Mayor Janey made Route 28, uh, that bus route free. And that was, the, the, the studies prove that that was incredibly impactful, that ridership um, increased exponentially. And, you know, how one navigates the city, your ability to get to work on time, to get to childcare, to get to a healthcare appointment, um, to connect with a neighbor, to build community. You know, ultimately, it's one thing to call a city your home. It's another thing entirely for it to be livable. You know, for you to um, experience every corner of the city. And that has everything to do with access to affordable, rapid and reliable transit. So I'm encouraged by the progress being made on the local level. And then federally, uh, myself and um, Senator Markey uh, introduced the Freedom to Move Act, uh, which would do exactly what it states, uh, empower people with the freedom to move. And uh, there's national momentum in support of this bill, and we continue to push um, for um, the Build Back Better Act resources for free transit. Um, you know, although, so, you know, that, that advocacy, that advocacy continues and, you know, the, the resources are there. You know, we have a $750 billion defense and Pentagon budget. And um, I, so this is not a, a matter of a deficit of resource. Um, it has been, I think, a matter of a deficit of, of empathy to understand uh, just how uh, demoralizing it is when you can't get where you need to get to. Um, when you can't get there on time. Um, you know, I know exactly what that feels like having depended on public transit uh, for, for most of my life. And so uh, transit justice is an economic justice issue. It is a climate justice issue. It is a housing justice issue. And it's a racial justice issue. Uh, several years ago, uh, Livable Streets, partners that I work with, uh, transit justice advocates uh, produced a report that said that the average black Boston bus rider rides an extra 64 hours a year. 
uh, that they are writing, waiting, transferring. Uh, and so again, that has an impact on economic justice. Uh, people's ability to uh, get to a job interview, uh, to get to work on time. Um, all of those things will help to close the racial wealth gap. Uh, and um, again, transit justice is really at the intersection of all of these things. I should add, I am the co-chair of the Congressional Bike Caucus, and I'm also a co-founder of the Future of Transportation Caucus. Um, so in addition to the legislation that I've introduced with Senator Markey and the Freedom to Move Act, a championing for us to invest in public transit as the public good that it, it is. Uh, I've also founded this future transportation caucus so that the federal government will invest in transportation uh, federally, which centers equity, accessibility, sustainability, and connectivity to jobs and to education. Congresswoman, our next question. And it asks, how are we supporting our undocumented immigrant community already in the country? Well, um, you know, there were, there were two bills that we were seeking to advance, the, the bipartisan infrastructure package, which has been signed into to law. And you'll feel, you know, the, the impact of that over the next uh, five years. And that's physical infrastructure, you know, highways, roads, bridges, broadband. And then the Build Back Better Act, which was an investment in uh, human infrastructure, everything from universal childcare and pre-K to paid leave to home and community-based services for the disabled and elderly, to unprecedented housing investments, to much needed, uh, a much needed pathway to citizenship. Um, for our DACA recipients, uh, DED, TPS holders, um, asylum seekers. So um, we have not given up. We're not seeding a defeat on uh, Build Back Better uh, or on a much needed pathway uh, to citizenship. This is about centering uh, the humanity and the dignity of all of our neighbors. And, you know, I could speak to the many contributions that our immigrant neighbors make to our tax base, to civic life, to culture. Um, but honestly, to me, this is just a, a matter of humanity. Um, you know, it's, we don't need to push any sort of exceptional narrative here. Um, you know, these are our, our loved ones. These are our neighbors. And in centering the humanity and the dignity of them in prioritizing the preservation of our mixed immigration status households, the preservation of families, we need to continue to push President Biden to act by executive action, because until we grow uh, the majority in the Senate and can potentially abolish the filibuster to advance meaningful uh, immigration reform and a pathway to citizenship and the many other pieces of legislation which are critical uh, to, to real people's lives and, uh, and to civil rights and to justice and so many other things that continue to be obstructed, the president uh, must act by executive action for as long as we're going to be met by legislative obstruction uh, in the Senate. Because again, we have made great strides in, in passing um, uh, some of these things out of the House, but have been met by obstruction on the Senate side. So we need to continue to push, and we need to continue to push back against ICE and CBP. Um, again, I serve on the Oversight Committee and have called for investigations and hearings into the actions of ICE and CBP, I believe it's a racist and rogue agency that has been proven time and time again. When President Biden took office, they put a 100 day halt to deportations and yet deportations continued. Um, and uh, that impact was, was disparately felt um, by black immigrants, um, African and Haitian uh, in particular. So um, that fight continues. Thank you again, Congresswoman. Uh, that indeed was our final question for tonight. And so we wanna again, thank everyone for attending tonight's virtual town hall. Uh, one more thing, just wanna say that if you ever need anything from our office, um, please feel free to visit our website, which again is presley.house.gov, or you can call our district office directly at 617-850-0040. And so at this time, Congresswoman, I'll turn it over to you one final time for any final remarks you may have. Just thank you. Um, you know, I look forward to the, the day when we can all be together in community together 
uh, you know, real soon, but in the interest of the public health and uh, in a commitment to be intentional about updating you, we will until then continue convening these virtual town halls monthly. Um, and again, I thank you all for submitting questions uh, in advance of today's town hall uh, and in real time. And I hope that you'll remain connected to our office and know that we are here as a resource and support. And um, again, it's a great honor to serve as your Congresswoman. And then as a, as a note of personal privilege, I'll just close by saying go Celtics. Okay. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. And thank you to MAP. Uh, thank you, uh, Didier, for our uh, translation services this evening as well. We appreciate you, brother.